The seventh is called the true mark of impartial bowing. It describes a person who bows and yet does not bow, who does not bow while he's, he bows. When I say this, some of you are thinking to say we should bow and yet not bow, and not bow and yet bow. Therefore, if I don't bow to the Buddha, won't I be bowing to the Buddha? This is not what I mean. With this kind of bowing, although you bow to the Buddha, you are not attached to a mark of bowing to the Buddha. You cannot distort the meaning and say that why you are not bowing to the Buddha, it counts as bowing to the Buddha. One who speaks like this is mentally disturbed. For example, recently, someone told me that he had attained the void. This is an extremely stupid thing to say. What is more, people like this cannot be helped and there is no way to save them because their heavy attachment nature makes them too stupid. The true mark of impartial bowing means that I am bowing to the Buddha. I am impartially bowing to the triple jewel. I am reverent to the Buddha, reverent to the drama, and reverent to the Sangha. Although I bow in this way, I never the least do not discriminate that I am bowing and not one thought is produced, nor is one through thought destroyed. This is the drama of the true mark of impartial bowing. It is a drama which involves neither production nor destruction. When not even one thought arises, the entire substance appears. When you bow to the Buddha, to the point that not even one thought is produced, you manifest your body throughout the entire Dharma realm. Although your body is bowing here, it is the same size as the Dharma realm. This is just the true mark which has no mark. You bow until there are no people, no self, no living beings, and no lifespan. You become one and the same substance, substance with the Dharma realm. Your body is just the Dharma realm, and the Dharma realm is not it's your body. Is this not wonderful? Before, your body was just a speck of Mount Sumeru, and Mount Sumeru was the size of a dust mold in a Dharma realm. But when you reach the point of the true appearance, which has no appearance, Mount Sumeru is contained within your Dharma body. You now contain Mount Sumeru. Is this not wonderful? You totally contain everything. Everything in the universe, in, in the universe is contained within your nature and you understand everything. The true mark of impartial bowing is inconceivable state. If you can reach this state while bowing to the Buddha, can you then explain all of his wonderful aspects? No, they are ineffable. This has been a simple explanation of the seven kinds of bowing which describe the proper etiquette and pro propriety one should observe while bowing to the triple jewel. If you wish to discuss this um, in more detail, there are 300 forms of propriety and the 3000 awesome departments. In China, there is a book called The Book of Rice which describes propriety how one should conduct oneself. It describes the proper etiquette for different situations. For example, it says that everyone should take his proper position when sitting down indoors, or should sit in the places for indoors, and children should sit in their place. Men have a proper place, women have a proper place, and elder people sit in their place no one can sit at random. I will give you a more, a more specific example. The Book of Rice says youths should sit in the corners. Children should not sit in the middle of a room, but should sit in the corners. In the past, when I was a child, I talked a lot about propriety. What kind of propriety did I advocate? I lacked people to respect me. When I was a child, I had an emperor in China. We had an emperor in China and I wished to be an emperor. So under my system of propriety, all the children in the town, perhaps 50 or 100, had to follow my orders. I had them build a 
mount of dirt upon which I saw and told all of them to bow to me. This was before I had reached the age of twelve, and strange enough, these children were not opposed to bowing to me, but obediently listened to my orders. When I was young, I wanted people to bow to me, but after my twelfth birthday, I saw a dead child and realized that people die. After that, I trained this bad practice and did not wish people to bow to me any more. In fact, on the contrary, I wished to bow to others. Whom did I bow to first? My parents. In the morning, I bowed to my parents three times, and in the evening, I bowed to them again, bowing a total of six times per day. But then I thought, my parents are the only people in the world. There is heaven and earth, and the emperor and my teacher. At that time, I did not know who my teacher would be, but I knew I would meet him in the future, so I wished to bow to him beforehand. Most people would think that all this bowing was really idiotic, but again I thought, this world has sages, so I will bow to them, and it has immortals, so I will bow to them too. Then I discovered that there are Buddhas in the world, and so I bowed, bowed to them. I bowed to Bodhisattvas, sound hearers, those enlightened to conditions, and then I thought, the world has very many good people living in it. So I bowed to the good people, and they are also kind people. So I bowed to the kind people because they do what is proper, and I wanted to represent everyone to thank them for their proper actions. For example, I would wonder why they did keen things like helping the poor, and so I thanked them for the poor people by bowing to them. By this time, I was bowing quite a lot when I thought I bowed to the kind people, but since the evil people are pitiful, I should bow to the Buddha on their behalf and ask the Buddha to cause them to forsake their offenses and do good instead of evil. So I bowed to the Buddha for all those in the world who have offenses, repenting to the Buddha on their behalf. Moreover, I repented to the Buddha for all those who were not filial to their parents and bowed in repentance for all the devil people of the world because I felt I was the worst of them. When all was said and done, I was bowed more than 830 times and I will tell you my practice was very strange. I got up before anyone's got dressed and washed my face. I lit a stick of incense and went outside to bow. Regardless of whether or not it was windy, rainy or snowy, I bowed outside. When it snowed, I placed my hands in the uh, in my hand in the snow and bowed, not caring whether or not it was cold. I would bow more than 830 times, which would take about an hour, an hour and a half. I bowed before everyone woke up and again after everyone had gone to bed, practicing like this for many years. Later, when I cultivated filial practices by my mother's graveside, I decreased the bows to nine because it is up to much time. This is how I bowed to the Buddha and practiced in my youth. What does respect mean? It means to act in accord with the, real, with the rules of propriety governing the circumstances of the situation at hand. To always act according to the proper etiquette shows respect, whereas to disregard the proper etiquette is dis disrespect, disrespectful. For example, if you respect someone, you will act in accordance with the proper rules and when you are in their presence. If you do not wish to act respectfully towards a person, then you would be very lax in their presence, doing whatever you want. Now we wish to worship and respect all Buddhas. All Buddhas refers to all the Buddhas of the ten directions and the three periods of time. Buddha means greatly enlightened. 
a person who is greatly enlightened. Common people are born in a stupor and die in a dream without the understanding that the, the three realms are suffering. They do not wish to transcend them. This is called being unenlightened. Among people, there are some who are considered to be enlightened, called those of the two vehicles. They have awakened to the fact that birth and death are impermanent and very dangerous, and so they cultivate and achieve understanding based on the principle of empty, emptiness, a one-sided prejudice for emptiness. By virtue of understanding this principle, they enlighten to the dramas of the travelings of causes and conditions and the four noble truths. They are called a has and those enlightened to conditions and can be considered as enlightened ones. When speaking from, from the point of view of common people, they, their enlightenment, however, is one-sided and incomplete because they only know how to benefit themselves and cannot benefit others. They are only capable of enlightening themselves and cannot guide others to the realization of enlightenment. Buddhist advice are different from our hearts in as much as they are not only able to enlighten themselves, but they can also enlighten others benefiting both themselves and others. Buddhas are different from Bodhisattvas. Other Bodhisattvas are able to enlighten themselves and others. Their enlightenment is imperfect. The enlightenment and practices of the Buddha, however, are perfect since the Buddha has perfected his enlightenment. The enlightenment of others and enlightenment and practices so only a Buddha is called a greatly enlightened one, having practiced these three aspects of enlightenment. When a person has perfected the 10,000 kinds of merit and virtue, he becomes a Buddha. Some of the high Buddhism only recognizes one Buddha, Shakyamuni, and does not acknowledge other Buddhas in the world systems of the other directions. The drama of the small vehicle was taught in the deer park of the five bishops for the five bishops, and as a consequence, those of the small vehicle only know of Shakyamuni Buddha becoming a Buddha and know nothing about all the, the immeasurable Buddhas in, the world, in other world systems. Because of this, they say that there are no Buddhas throughout the ten directions and the three periods of time other than Shakyamuni. Now is it true that there are no other Buddhas since they say that there are no others? No. If they recognize the other Buddhas throughout the ten directions, then those Buddhas exist. But if they do not recognize those Buddhas, those Buddha nonetheless still exist. The Buddhas of the ten directions are only with Shakyamuni Buddha, so it is said, the Buddhas of the ten directions and the three Buddhas of time share one Dhamma body in common. Universal worthy Bodhisattva made these ten far reaching vows to guide his practice. All of the vows are extremely great to the point that they are inconceivable, so that there is no way one can know how great they are. It is because of this that universal worthy Bodhisattva is called the King of Vows. For the first vow is to worship and respect all Buddhas. To worship and respect all Buddhas does not mean to worship only Shakyamuni Buddha or Amitabha. Worshipping one is worshipping all. One Buddha is all Buddhas. Worshipping all Buddhas without becoming attached to all Buddhas and worship one Buddha without becoming attached to one Buddha is the practice of the true mark of impartial bowing. Although you bow to the Buddha in worship, regardless of whether it is one Buddha or all Buddhas, one should not become attached to the mark of worship. For example, you do not say want to say my merit and virtue is great indeed since I bow to so many Buddhas. No one else can match such a practice as mine. 
to not become the attached to marks in this way or the other way and then you will truly be able to practice the first vow to worship and respect all dharmas the second is to praise the first come one when we worship and respect all buddha so we do so because they want the respect of others Regardless of whether we worship the Buddhas or not, there are still Buddhas. If we worship the Buddhas, they do not obtain more benefit or get longer. And if you do not worship the Buddhas, they do not lose any benefit or get smaller. When we worship the Buddhas, it fertilizes our hearts and spring, but it does not affect the Buddhas. So when we worship the Buddhas, the Buddhas do not become attached to my mark. Why should we praise the first come one? They do not need our praise. They are not like us. When we are praised, we become so happy and our eyes and nose wrinkle up with laughter. But if we are not praised, our arms and ears get angry. If the Buddha were like this, they would be no different from common to people, so it is not necessary to praise or to worship them. Moreover, if they were the same as common people, what value would there be in worshipping them? However, if they were the same as common people, what value would there be uh, in worshipping and praising them? On the other hand, since we just do not need or our praise then why praise them this not is it a contradiction it certainly is not a contradiction when we praise the buddhas we obtain merit and virtue for our self nature how can this merit and virtue be described everyone's self nature has light and when you praise the buddhas your own young light radiates and shines through the darkness of your ignorance. The merit and virtue which comes from praising the Buddha is, is inconceivable and is brought about to cause and commit no offenses. To obtain his merit and virtue, you cannot indulge in false thinking and the fewer false thoughts you have, the more the light of your wisdom flows forth. Cultivator of the way fears having false thoughts because false thoughts define the self-nature with darkness. If you are without false thoughts, the light of your self-nature shines through brighter and brighter. When you praise the Buddhas, you cherish the Buddha and when you cherish the Buddha, you unite with the wisdom light of the Buddhas. Then the light of your self-nature spills forth. What does it mean to praise the first come ones? You can say, in the heaven above and the earth below, there is no one like the Buddha. No one in the walls, in the ten directions equals him. I have seen everything in the world and nothing compares with the Buddha. This is an example of praising the first come ones in the heavens, in the earth and in between. No one is like the Buddha. There is no spirit, bodhisattvas, or has, or pratika buddhas who compare with the Buddha. So the verse reads, In heaven above and the earth below, there is no one like the Buddha. No one can compare. No one can compare with the Buddha. Not a single being in all the world systems of the ten directions compares with him. Not only is there no one found in their heaven above and the earth below who can compare with the Buddha. The same is true throughout the worlds of the ten directions. Our world has five continents, Asia, the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Although it is made up of these five, it is still just one world beyond this world there are still an immeasurable about this number 
of one of one of the ten directions. Now we send people to the moon in rough case. The moon may be considered one of those other worlds, but it is just one minute world among an infinite of other worlds. None of the great number of people and creatures in all the worlds throughout the ten directions compares with the Buddha. I have seen everything in the world and within it. Nothing compares with the Buddha. This is what is meant by praising the Buddha's name. By praising the first come ones.